Welcome to our second lecture for Composing with Sound. The title of this lecture is Composing Sound, What is a Sound? So during the lecture we hope to uh, achieve a number of goals. You'll see with the lecture series in this subject that the lectures parallel the practical work that you're doing in the tutorials and they introduce higher level concepts that can help you to understand some of the underlying principles or the application of the underlying principles that we're exploring in the tutorials. So in this lecture we hope to visualize and oralize key technical components of frequency and timbre. We're going to introduce and demonstrate the concept of stream segregation and integration as the basis for differentiating a sound. We're going to demonstrate the fusion of harmonics as a basis for streaming. Demonstrate the amplitude envelope as a basis for streaming. Demonstrate harmonic and inharmonic sounds and consider the concepts above as parameters for sound composition. So there's quite a lot of technical information that we're going to try and get across in this lecture. So hold on, I hope by the end you will have learned something interesting. So I'm asking you the question, what do you hear? Uh, one of the key skills that we need to be learning in this subject and other subjects in music and sound design are listening skills. So when you're asked a question like this, what do you hear? Uh, you might come up with a whole range of different types of responses. So for example, you might say, well, I hear the soundscape of a large city. You might say, I hear noise. Uh, perhaps you might decompose that field of sound down into its constituent parts. You might say, well, I can hear voices, I can hear car horns, um, I can hear the sounds of vehicles. Uh, it sounded like a piece of paper blowing past it at one stage. So there are a lot of different uh, sorts of responses that you might make to hearing a complex sound field like this. So in the accompanying uh, Max patch that I'm going to show you, uh, it, I want to demonstrate a couple of things about this sound. So first I'm going to show you a graph, which is a graph of amplitude against time. And this really represents the variations in air pressure that were recorded by the microphone when this sound recording was made. So in this patch you can see a graph uh, of time on the horizontal axis and amplitude on the vertical axis going from positive 1 through 0 in the middle to minus 1. So these are variations in air pressure. And you can see this sort of crazy random looking uh, pattern that's produced by the sounds of this uh, recording. Now the point that I'm trying to make here is that variations in air pressure alone really can't account for the fact that we're able to decode this sound into its individual constituent components which we might label uh, with words like voices, car horn, car sounds, and, and so forth. <laughs> 
So how do we explain how these seemingly random variations in air pressure are turned into discrete identifiable sounds by our auditory system, by our ability to hear? So this is a, a, a fascinating question. And so I want to try and start finding some answers uh, to this question. Well, one way of thinking about this is to, uh, or one way of understanding how the ear works is by breaking down sound into its individual frequency components. So this is a term that we need to begin to understand. So in the max patch that I'm about to show you, uh, we see what's called a spectrogram. It's a plot of the frequency spectrum of the sound. So this uses a special algorithm called a Fourier transform, which takes a continuously varying uh, time domain signal and displays the frequency components. Let's jump back into our max patch and uh, I'm going to uh, play our sound again. Bring the sound up a little bit so we can hear it. And here is our uh, spectrogram. And we can see that uh, the horizontal axis here is in frequency measured in hertz or cycles per second. So right in the middle of our hearing range we have 1000 or 1 kilohertz. And uh, we go down to 100 hertz, 10 hertz, up to 10 kilohertz. Uh, and 20 kilohertz. Now, when individual sound pitched sound events occur, for example, a horn or a squeaking brake, you'll see little peaks rise up in the frequency content. And some of those frequency peaks we can clearly discern. When that car horn sounded, we saw a sequence of little peaks in the frequency content. Now it just so happens that our ears have a uh, biological frequency analyzer built into them. Inside the inner ear, in the cochlea, there is a series of little hair cells called cilia and uh, each one of these bundles of hair cells responds to a different range of frequencies. So we have a physiological frequency analyzer built into our ear, which our brain then goes on to be able to decode. So we've introduced some key concepts that we need to try and unpack. So I've introduced the idea of frequency and frequency components, and of course you've heard these terms before. You've probably heard that our auditory system is able to respond to frequencies in the range of 20 to 20,000 hertz. And perhaps this is a abstract idea. You might have heard that the fundamental frequency of, say, the pitch of concert A is 440 hertz. That's the A above middle C. Let's try and uh, understand this concept of frequency in a little bit more detail. So the patch that I'm going to show you, the same patch, uh, I'm going to use it to try and uh, introduce the concept of frequency. You can think of frequency, perhaps you might think of your bus timetable, you know, what is the frequency of the bus at, the, at your local uh, stop? Well, at my local bus stop, the bus comes once every hour, so it has a frequency of one bus per hour. So that this is the basic idea of frequency. And uh, in, in terms of audio, it's applied to variations in air pressure. And sounds that are pitched have a regular variation in air pressure. And that, air, that variation goes from positive to negative at a certain frequency or rate of cycles per second. Let's, uh, let's have a little listen to the patch. Okay, so uh, this part of the patch produces a range of different uh, waveforms, and we're going to learn more about those. We have a rectangular waveform, a sine wave, a triangle wave, and a sawtooth wave. We're going to start with the rectangular wave, because uh, it's very easy to see and hear. Uh, 
So I'm going to start by setting the frequency or the uh, well, I'll just show you a picture of what a rectangular waveform looks like. So uh, I'll set the frequency to 100 hertz, which sounds a little bit like that. And now I'm going to use this uh, graph of variations in uh, signal level over time to show you the typical shape of that uh, square wave pattern. So it's called a square because it's uh, or rectangular wave um, because it has these sharp corners and you can see that it goes uh, from positive pressure down to negative pressure or positive amplitude down to negative amplitude at a regular rate and if we trace the waveform from this point here it goes up and across and down and across and then the cycle starts again so this area here is, is what we would call one cycle. And you can see that within that one cycle, we have these abrupt changes from positive to negative, And we get two of those in every cycle, one here and one here. Now what you're going to hear is a click as the waveform goes positive and the loudspeaker uh, moves forward rapidly and it goes click. And then it moves backwards rapidly and goes click. And so I'm going to change here to half a cycle per second because in each half cycle there is one click so we should as a result of that here one click per second which would be a frequency of uh, of one Hertz so you should be able to hear that and if you get out your watch you can see the second hand ticking past one two three four five six so this is a frequency of one cycle per second or one hertz now if i change the frequency here to uh, the underlying frequency to one hertz we get two clicks in every cycle So we're hearing two clicks per second or, or two hertz. So you'll see the, the frequency is just sitting one below because each cycle has two clicks, a positive click and a negative click. And as I increase the rate, you can still count the number of clicks. Here we've got four clicks every second, six clicks every second or six hertz, eight clicks every second, 10 clicks every second. Now. You could probably just about count those if you count very fast. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But once I go up above about 10 hertz, we can no longer hear individual clicks and we hear a kind of uh, throbbing sound. So now we've got 16 clicks per second. And here we are at, at 20 clicks per second. And at this point, we start to hear a tone. And we could almost sing this, I think, when we get to about 40 hertz, we're down to the bottom E string on the bass guitar. I can sing that note, sort of. Okay, so hopefully I've shown you here how we get from the idea of frequency in cycles per second. We can hear those cycles per second here. Once we get over the threshold up to above 20 hertz, we don't no longer hear individual pulses, we hear a pitch or a tone. And I can play our concert A440. There it is. And an octave below, 
every time we halve the frequency we go down by an octave. Okay, so we've introduced the concept of frequency or cycles per second and we know that our ears perceive frequencies above about 20 hertz as a pitched tone. Now, the square wave that we've been listening to is what we might call a complex waveform. And one of the concepts that we're going to get is this idea of a, a simple or a complex waveform. So in my patch, I'm able to produce a range of different uh, complex waveforms the square wave or rectangular wave, the triangle wave, and the sawtooth wave. And if I show you them on the spectrogram, you'll see that they, they seem to produce a series of uh, peaks. So uh, here's a 220 hertz waveform, and uh, here's the spectrogram. And you can see if this is 100 hertz, this is 200 hertz. Here's the peak at 200 hertz, 200, 300 400, 500, 600. So we have another peak at 600 hertz. 7, 8, 9, 10, 1000 hertz, and so forth. We have a, a series of, of peaks. Now I'm going to switch to, just turn the volume down a little bit there, switch over to a triangle wave. And I change this frequency to 100 because it's a little bit easier to read on the spectrogram. So here you can see uh, a peak close to 100 hertz and another and another and another a sequence of, of peaks going up. And I'll just play you a sort tooth wave. And you can see a much more complex set of frequency components. And now I'm going to show you the sine wave, which has just one peak. Now this isn't a very accurate graph uh, because of the way the algorithm works. If I increase the frequency up here to 2000 hertz, rather annoying sound, you can see that there's a much sharper peak, a single peak. Okay, so the sine wave contains energy at just one frequency, whereas the other geometrical waveforms that we've seen contain energy at a whole lot of different frequencies. So what is this magical uh, sine wave? Let's learn something more about that. Um, now I'm going to come back to the harmonic series slide. First I'm going to introduce the idea of a sine wave. Now this video is a rather wonderful uh, representation of what's called simple harmonic motion. So it shows a spray can, a paint spray can, attached to a spring and the can sprays onto a roll of paper that's moved past the spray can at a regular rate and you'll see that it traces out uh, this simple geometrical waveform called a sine wave, which has energy at just one frequency. It's really a rather wonderful demonstration. Now let's go back to the max patch and see if we choose our sine wave and uh, display it over here on our graph. You can see that typical uh, sine wave pattern of a pure tone with energy at just one frequency. <laughs> 
Okay, so back to the earlier uh, slide. Um, these complex waveforms, the pitched waveforms, the square wave, the triangle wave, and the sawtooth wave, we hear the fact that they're pitched because they're made up of a series of sine wave components we, whose frequencies make up what's called the harmonic series. So the harmonic series is the series of pure tones, or sine waves, whose frequencies are related as integer multiples of a fundamental frequency. Okay, so there's some maths jargon there. So integers are just the whole numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we have frequencies, uh, sine wave components, whose frequencies are 1 times, 2 times, three times, four times the frequency of the fundamental. So back to our little patch here, let's uh, dial up a sawtooth waveform, centered at 100 hertz. Sounds like this. The waveform looks like this, that's our sawtooth waveform, it ramps up and then drops down. Oh, I haven't showed you the pictures of the different wave types. Here's our triangle wave. And you can see that it uh, is symmetrical. It goes up and goes down. And we were looking at our sawtooth wave. And if we look at the spectrogram, the fundamental, well, it doesn't graph very well here. It uh, doesn't appear to be exactly 100. Let's, uh, let's try out one. We can see the fundamental here just close to 1,000 and one close to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, 11, and so forth. These are the integer multiples, one times, two times, three times, four times. When we get a waveform that repeats itself in shape regularly, we know that it's made up of a series of harmonic components, that is, sine waves that belong to the harmonic series. Okay, so as we heard each of those tones, we you probably noted that they seem to be one, each one seemed to be one continuous sound. The sine wave only contained one sine wave component, the square wave, or rectangular wave, contained a series of sine wave components. Now, we didn't hear a series of sine wave components, we just heard one rather bright, buzzy sounding tone. So, a question you might be asking yourself is, why, why do we lose the ability to hear these individual components? Why do we hear just one sound? What is this sort of integration that's going on here? Before we answer that question, I'm going to just go over some of the concepts or terms that we've, uh, that we've introduced. So I've used the term uh, partial or frequency component. A partial is any frequency component of a complex waveform. So when I'm referring to a complex waveform, I'm referring to any waveform other than a sine wave which is a simple or pure tone. I've introduced the idea of a harmonic, or the harmonic series. A, a harmonic is a frequency component that belongs to the harmonic series. So the harmonic series are the multiples of the fundamental in frequency. One times, two times, three times, four times the, the frequency of the fundamental. So the harmonics are a subset of all the possible partials. Some instrument sounds contain only harmonics, and some instrument sounds such as, let's say, a cymbal or a gong, contain uh, a whole series of partials, and they're not necessarily harmonic or harmonics. And you can always tell, because if it's difficult to sing the pitch or identify the pitch, you know that it's not a harmonic sound, we'd call that an inharmonic sound. So a harmonic sound is any sound whose partials come from the harmonic series, from the harmonic series of its fundamental. These sounds have pitch, and if we see a graph of these sounds at amplitude against time, you'll see that the waveform repeats itself.
An inharmonic sound is any sound whose partials do not come from the harmonic series. And for these sounds it's usually difficult to determine the pitch, so a snare drum, a cymbal, any unpitched sound. Interestingly, in, in most real instruments, rather than electronically synthesized instruments, such as, you know, the sound of a guitar or a piano, the sound does actually contain inharmonic partials, but the strength of the harmonic partials is much louder than the inharmonic partials, and so we hear pitch. Okay, so we're going to do some more experiments. We're going to try adding frequency components together, adding sine wave components together to see what happens. And uh, in this experiment, first we're going to add two tones that are not harm harmonically related, and as we'll see, they re this results in two easily perceived separate sounds. And then we're going to try an experiment in which we add sounds, frequency components, sine waves from the harmonic series together, and hopefully we'll get a sense of them fusing together into a single sound. Let's, uh, let's try that experiment. Okay, so here's my demonstration patch. Now this patch has a number of different features. We can set the fundamental pitch here in either note names or in hertz. So here we see uh, the pitch C in octave 2 has a frequency of about 130 hertz. Uh, I have a set of controls for controlling the amplitude of a set of sine wave components. So there's a sine wave, which we will call the fundamental, at 130 hertz. And uh, I have a set of numbers which can be used to multiply the frequency of the fundamental. So fundamental is one times, the first harmonic is two times, three times, four times, five times for the subsequent harmonics. And I can add those harmonics together with these sliders. Here we can see the uh, oscillogram uh, display, which shows amplitude on the vertical axis against time on the horizontal axis, and you can see that that first frequency component there is a pure sine wave, and all the subsequent frequency components are pure sine waves in themselves. And at the bottom of the display here we have the spectrogram, which shows peaks uh, in the frequency content where these sine wave components occur. Okay, so these individual tones are frequency components in the harmonic series. And when we add them together, we get a pitched sound. The pitch here is C uh, in the second octave. Now I've got some preset uh, numbers for my multiplying factors for each of the frequency components. This is the harmonic series, one times, two times, three times, and this is just a random set of fractional numbers. Now, the first thing that I want to demonstrate to you is that if we take two frequency components, so this is 3.142, or close to pi, times 130 hertz, and if we add just some other random frequency component, so this is 5.67 times this frequency, you can clearly hear two separate tones. You can see the two separate frequency components here, and you can see that the waveform is not a repeating pattern. These two tones haven't really blended together or fused together. They're just two separate tones, and we can probably keep in our ear three of these separate uh, partials, frequency partials. You can hear those three separate tones. First one, oops, the second one, and the third one that we heard. And we don't, they don't really fuse together, they, we can hear them as three separate tones. Now if I change the arrangement here so that instead of being this inharmonic series, uh, in harmonic series of partials, I make the harmonic series. Now, when I add together the fundamental with the first harmonic, there's something 
similar about those two tones. Now, it just so happens that the first harmonic is an octave higher. That one is an octave higher than that one. Those of you who've done some ear training will be able to hear that very clearly. And when we add those together, they're not quite so distinct once we get the amplitude in, in proportion like this. As I increase the amplitude of the second one, it becomes more audible. But to me, that sounds like one kind of rich uh, tone. And we can see from the oscillogram pattern here that this waveform is indeed a repeating pattern. So this is one of the properties of harmonic sounds. Now when I add the uh, second harmonic, and those of you with good ears will have noticed that when that tone was first introduced, it sounded as though it was an octave and a fifth above the, uh, the fundamental. Don't worry if these musical terms don't mean much to you, but for those of you who've got perceptive ears, you'll hear this. But after a while, those three tones are no longer separate. It feels like one fused tone, a little bit richer in timbre than the original one. And I'm going to add the third harmonic. But if I get the proportions just right, they start to once again fuse into each other. And here we can see that characteristic repeating shape of a, an harmonic waveform, or a pitched waveform. And I can add the next harmonic. we have a, a fairly tightly fused kind of tone. Now if I change the frequency components up so that they're inharmonic, we get something that's not pitched, you can't sing the fundamental frequency, and you can see the waveform doesn't repeat, so this is my weird set of fractional relationships. If I replace that with the integer relationships, we get a clear fused tone. Now I can simulate something that looks a little bit like the triangle wave. Now you'll see that triangle wave, any symmetrical waveform, only has the odd harmonics. Or a sawtooth wave, quite a bit brighter, but containing all the harmonics. This is just one of the properties of this uh, particular geometrical waveform. And you can hear that they're tightly fused. I mean, this could be perhaps um, a bassoon or something sound of a, of a pitched instrument. Uh, the next element in this patch, which I'll introduce a little later, is this uh, amplitude, overall amplitude envelope, with which we're able to impart a shape to all the harmonic components together. And this um, is another element in causing uh, sound to be fused together, if all the harmonics have what's called a common fate. So the first psychoacoustic principle that we've learnt here, hopefully, is that harmonically related frequency components tend to fuse into a single perceptual stream that we might think of as a sound or a tone, as opposed to just sound. So the inharmonic sound is a bit, it's not quite a tone, it's, uh, it's in, it's, uh, it is perhaps what we might just call sound. So in this patch, what we've been seeing is an example of what's called additive synthesis. We're adding together pure sine wave components. We just jump back quickly and you'll see that uh, each one of these components is a sine wave in its own right with energy at only one frequency. So there are a range of different techniques for synthesizing complex sounds. Uh, and this is what's called additive synthesis, adding together some pure sine waves. 
But there are other techniques, uh, for example, subtractive synthesis, which we'll learn about later, where we start with a complex waveform, a sawtooth waveform or a square wave, and we subtract frequency components from it using filtering. Last week we saw John Chowning's uh, piece Stria and the Yamaha DX7 synthesizer. This uses a technique called frequency modulation. So we will learn about that as we go along. And there are other techniques, granular synthesis, and you may have come across other methods. So we just quickly insert a definition here of additive synthesis. Additive synthesis is the technique of combining simple sine wave components or partials to create a complex waveform. Both harmonic and inharmonic sounds may be created and Interestingly, time-varying timbres may be made by applying unique amplitude envelopes to each partial. Now, I mentioned that we could make uh, harmonic and inharmonic sounds. Uh, so if I use my amplitude envelope here, there's my strange sort of bassoonish kind of sound. If I replace the frequency components with ones that are inharmonically related, we get a sort of chiming sound, perhaps if I get rid of the fundamental. We get something that's a bit more like a, a metallic kind of chime sound, and that's typically inharmonic. We can't sing the pitch of, of that sound. So I'm going to introduce some ideas uh, around uh, composing with sounds or hearing sounds. And uh, one of the most interesting historical characters to have explored this area is the French uh, composer and theorist Pierre Schaeffer, the inventor of music concrète. He proposed a fundamental law of musical discourse. So he asked the question, well, what is music? What defines it? And uh, he, he suggested that the sounds that we choose to make music with uh, traditionally have followed this uh, law, which he called the permanence uh, and variation, law of permanence and variation. And that is that some element of the sound will remain the same while another element is varied. So the archetype for this is a musical melody played on an instrument or sung in which the instrument timbre itself remains the same while the pitch varies. So the, the timbre remains the same and the pitch varies. Let's see if I can just quickly demonstrate that idea uh, with my uh, with my little patch here. So uh, here is uh, a sound. So the timbre is defined by the amp relative amplitudes and the frequencies of each of the fundamentals of each of the harmonics. Sorry, and. We vary the pitch. It's a rather cumbersome way of, of making music, but you get the idea. This is Schaefer's idea. Um, we get a melody, ba, 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 ba. The timbre remains the same, but the pitch, the, f the frequencies of each of the components, varies. He called this the law of permanence and variation. You might also think of other ways of applying this. So you might think, for example, of a swell pedal or a wah-wah pedal on a guitar. Now, in this case, if you play a single note, the pitch remains the same. But as you move the pedal up and down, the timbre, in the case of a wah-wah pedal, changes, or the amplitude, the volume, changes in the case of a swell pedal. So these kind of musical forms uh, also follow the law of permanence and variation. For Schaefer, this was a fundamental defining characteristic of traditional musical instruments. And uh, this is really why we identify particular instrument sounds. So, for example, in that opening sound that I played for you of the uh, city soundscape, you are able to clearly identify a car horn. <laughs> 
that pitched sound, uh, slightly metallic, uh, you knew straight away that amongst all of that other jumble of noises, that was a car horn. And uh, this is what, what Schaefer would have referred to as the instrument identity of, of that sound. It's a particular set of harmonic components with specific amplitudes uh, related to each other. So one question is, you know, how might we take these rather simple ideas about sound and exploit them in a way that uh, could help us to start thinking about composing with sound rather than uh, composing uh, with sounds, which is a distinction that I made in the first lecture. So that's given you some things to think about, I hope. Uh, we've visualized and oralized uh, key technical concepts of frequency and timbre, hopefully made those a little bit more concrete for you. Uh, we've introduced and demonstrated the concept of stream segregation, which is what happens when we take a set of harmonically related frequency components. They, they uh, separate or they integrate into a stream that can be separated from other streams, the car horn separated from all the other noise in the streetscape. We've demonstrated the fusion of harmonics from the harmonic series, and I've suggested that that's uh, one of the basis, one of the bases for uh, streaming for the integration of sounds in our human auditory system. Uh, and I've shown you the amplitude envelope, which, which also helps to uh, give each of those harmonic components a common fate, which makes them fuse even more. And uh, each of these components, frequency, amplitude, timbre, are perhaps we could conceive of those as parameters in sound composition. So you might think rather than making a melody uh, with variations in pitch, you might consider making a composition in which the timbre changes from harmonic to inharmonic gradually over a period of time. Uh, Schoenberg uh, experimented with this method in what he called Klangfarben melody, uh, tone color melody, where he, where he used the orchestra as a way of keeping the pitch constant or a chord constant and varying the timbre of the sound by changing the levels of various instruments in the orchestra. Now we can do that uh, electronically by building an interesting patch to do that for us. Please uh, store up your questions for the tutorial. Uh, that uh, there's some references there at the end of the lecture, and uh, that concludes our lecture. I look forward to seeing you in the tutorial.